the way these things work, you get to control the dialogue. Because I'm here to hear from you. I'll respond to whatever questions you have, uh, however you lead the, uh, the conversation. That's what we're going to talk about. I'd like to know if there's anybody going to put any stops on the oil company from keep raising fuel all the time. My family's been in the trucking business since in the 40s. My husband, when he was 14, was let out of school early to take sleeves and nozzles up to Republic Steel. He was stopped at the gate because he wasn't old enough to win. There's some rates now. I mean, fuel was like a quarter then, 29 cents. Now there is some of my whole family still involved that are hauling freight for prices that was back in the 60s and the 70s when fuel was 50 and 60 cents. When some of my sons fuel up now, it's costing seven and eight hundred dollars to fill up their truck. Mm -hmm. The load doesn't pay good enough. A lot of the manufacturers want to pay a dollar between a dollar and a dollar fifty a mile. You cannot operate a tractor trailer on a dollar and fifty mm -hmm. cents a mile. The cost of fuel at the pump is controlled by many, many factors. The oil companies and their production. Uh, that's part of it. Are they still Taxes. getting their perks though? Well, their discounts. You know, I <clears throat> oil companies are private companies. We have a private sector economy. That's what feeds our system. Here's what here's what the problem though is with the price of gas at the pump. We still get most of our fuel, most of our oil from overseas. We import it. It's a simple law of supply and demand. If we want to be energy independent, if we want to drive fuel cost at the pump back down to reasonable cost for Americans, which I support, I'll tell you what my idea of a national energy vision is here in a second. We start by increasing domestic oil production here at home. You know we haven't built a refinery in America in approximately 35 years. So we're not producing gasoline and fuel here at home. We're buying it elsewhere. We own over three trillion barrels of oil that's on our land already. Question is, why don't we go drill for it? We've got an administration that doesn't support going after fossil fuels. You've heard what's happened with the coal industry, the shutting down of coal-fired power plants. If you think that the administration is not going to come after the oil and gas industry next, let me clue you in, they are. We've already seen some of the some of the uh, previews of some of the regulatory burden that they're going to put on uh, our ability to go after the oil and gas right here in Ohio. They want to insert themselves into the hydraulic fracturing process, a process that's been going on for 65 plus years safely. And Ohio does it well, but yet you've got the regulatory agencies in Washington that want to step on it. Here's what energy independence, in my view, looks like. And let me, and let me couch this with, with a statement. We talked a little bit, of, we talked about Apollo 13 earlier. I know many of you, because your hair is the same color as mine. Some of you even got whiter hair than mine. How many of you remember when John Kennedy said we're going to the moon in 10 years back in the early 60s? Remember that? Do you remember what that felt like? Do you remember going to grade school, and if you didn't have a television at school, that they would send you home because it was like a national holiday? Walter Cronkite became like a member of our family. Everybody was, was engrossed in this idea of, of putting a man on the moon and American exceptionalism. And if you look at all the innovation that came out of that period, it was unbelievable what we were able to accomplish. And we're still benefiting from that today. 
industries cropped up overnight. Millions of jobs were created and young people were lining up to get into college programs so that they could participate and get careers in, in, in the industries that were supporting space exploration. Imagine what would happen if we had an energy vision here in America that said by the end of the decade, over the next 10 years, we're going to become energy independent and secure. We're not going to buy a single drop of oil or energy from anybody else. We're going to produce it here at home. We're going, to, we're going to go after the oil and natural gas that we own. We're going to continue to harvest the vast amounts of coal that we own. We, we've got enough coal in this country to fuel our energy needs for generations to come. We're going to expand our nuclear footprint. We brought nuclear power to the world. It's the safest, most reliable form of energy on the planet. And the reason we don't produce it today is largely because we don't make the kind of steel that's necessary to enclose a nuclear reactor. We've shipped those jobs overseas, and we have to buy that material from Japan. And they got a 10-year backlog. We're going, to, we're going to find out even where wind and solar and alternative forms of energies fit into niche markets. Wind and solar, in my view, are never going to meet our energy needs on a large scale, but they have niche markets where they can do some good. And we ought to embrace that. And if we match that vision up with regulatory reform, where regulating agencies like the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers and the Department of the Interior are told, starting today, you're going to be partners in progress with America's industries. Instead of being the departments of no, if no is, a, is an answer because of, of, of an environmental concern that's valid, based on valid science, that's fine. But don't let no be the final answer. Work with those industries to solve the problems, not just throw up roadblocks. And if we had tax reform that would incentivize companies to start their businesses and to sustain their businesses and not have to send their money overseas to avoid the 35% corporate tax that we've got here in America, we would see America begin to get to moving again. Did you know that they, I, I heard it again today, they say over the next three to four years that, that this zip code here is going to be the most wealthiest zip code in America. You've heard that? Mm -hmm. Folks, it's happened. I talked to an oil executive last week that has set up shop down in the southern part of the district. He said, Bill, the kind of technology that has evolved over the last five years are producing unbelievable results. Typically, you might get a half a million barrels of oil out of the typical well that we would drill here in Ohio. He said the numbers that we are seeing, he said we're expecting to get potentially as much as three times that amount out of a single hole in the ground. Now you think about that. You're not talking about a 10, 20, or even 30 year journey. You're talking about a 40, 60, 80 year journey of prosperity in, an, in a region of America that in many, time, in many people's minds in Columbus and Washington get left behind. Life is going to change for us that live along the Ohio River because of what's happening in oil and natural gas. And the Keystone XL pipeline that would bring oil down from our neighbors in Canada at a much lower cost until we can drill our own than what we're buying it for in, uh, uh, from our Middle Eastern, some of the people that don't even like us very much. Um, that would be a benefit also. Create hundreds of thousands of jobs here in America, both construction jobs for the pipeline and then the jobs to process the oil.